You and I are from the cane piece. Most of us are from the cane piece. Lots of us like to forget it, but you know, some of us have come out a little earlier than others. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem is that the educational system in the past, though it, it certainly has prepared us to cope with the rest of the world in many respects, in many instances it has not prepared us to cope with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so many of us who indeed have come from the cane piece have forgotten about that cane piece. But those of us who can claim some wisdom and some insight into us, uh, uh, as complex a society as the Caribbean um, are the legatees. We are people who are the beneficiaries of the wisdom of that very cane piece. And the people from below, as George Lamming describes them, continue to be the source of energy for much that makes sense in the Caribbean. Good afternoon, and welcome to week five of 10 Weeks in Jamaica, Theater Conversations from Jamaica to the World. I'm Magdalena, co-founder and co-artistic director of Akiba Abaka Arts. We are an international theater production company that creates plays, concerts, talks, and processes for making plays, concerts, and talks for the global stage. This series is presented in partnership with Raw Management, an esteemed talent agency representing artists and groups across all genres in film, television, theater, voiceovers, branding, and endorsements. We are very grateful to work in collaboration with Ms. Nadine Rollins, Raw Management, Raw Management's managing director and co-curator of this series. 10 Weeks in Jamaica, Theater Conversations from Jamaica to the World is a talk series that shares the behind the scenes stories of Jamaica's theater community with the global theater community and members of the Jamaican and Caribbean diaspora. Each week, Jamaica's leading theater pioneers and practitioners narrate their histories and memories of the Jamaican stage and offer their visions for the future development of theater in this 21st century. This series is made possible by our sponsor and publisher, HowlRound.com, a free and open platform for theater makers nationwide that amplifies progressive, disruptive ideas about the art form and facilitates connections between diverse theater practitioners. 10 Weeks in Jamaica is also sponsored by the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the City University of New York in Manhattan. The Siegel Center is home to theater artists, scholars, students, performing arts managers, and the local and international performance communities. Now, whether you are joining us for the first time or you have been watching weekly since we started this series on November 1st, we thank you very much for being in our audience today and hope that you will return weekly through the end of the series on January 3rd. I'd like to invite you to click the subscribe button to become part of our growing family 
And you know, while you're at it, click that bell below too to get notified of upcoming episodes and engagements from our channel. And while you're at it, join us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are Akiba Abaka Arts on all platforms. As a child of the dance hall, I like to say, I am so excited about today's episode. You got a little taste of our topic today, moments ago with videos from the National Dance Company of Jamaica with Continuum, choreographed by one of our panelists, Marlon Sims, with the voice of the late, great Rex Nettleford. You also saw 50 seconds of the baddest dance hall masters class you're gonna get with Professor Expressions himself, Orville Hall, another panelist, and the beautiful, um, very talented Neela Ebanks will be with us also. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce my partner in crime, co-founder and co-artistic director, Akiba Abaka, a distinguished director, dramatist, producer, etc., cetera, et cetera. Akiba has been bringing theater to diverse communities throughout her 20 plus career, and she will be your host and moderator for today's conversation. Welcome, Akiba. Hey. Miss Magaline. Yeah, girl, let me tell you something. I am excited about to those days. days. I'm excited. Going to bring you back to those WERS days when you used to hold down the reggae program here in Boston, Miss yes. Magdalene. Yes. <laughs> Girl. I, I got to tell you, I could not wait for this episode. For this. I mean, they've all been exciting thus far, but, you know, being, you know, a true fan of reggae music, dance hall music, I'm really excited to see where this conversation is going to go and how it just um, dives more into the Jamaican theater scene and how the dance hall um, really comes into it. So I'm excited. So, But you know, we always say, Mags, me, you and Prasha, that we're really a dance hall theater company, you know, we're, yeah. or we're, that, we're a theater company founded on the principles of dance hall. Listen. Right? Whatever that means. But that Whatever was- that means. <laughs> So this is going to be awesome. Yes. Thank you so much, Magdalene. Have fun. <laughs> dancehall reggae or reggae dancehall is a part of Jamaican life and culture that refuses to be dismissed, reduced, or silenced. Like the technology of electromagnetic waves or electronic currents, dancehall contains and transmits what Aristotle named in his artistic proofs, the ethos, ethics or principles, the pathos, emotions or relationships, and the logos, logic or reason of the stories of the Jamaican people. Ralston Milton Nettleford, OM, Order of Merit, OCC, Order of the Caribbean Community, known belovedly as Professor Rex Nettleford, was a Jamaican scholar, political scientist, choreographer, teacher, and cultural architect. He founded the world-renowned National Dance Theater Company of Jamaica, NDTC, and served as vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies from 1998 to 2004. His love and protection of his Jamaican country roots and his overall Caribbean being made him the cultural godfather of every Jamaican child that has ever been born or that will ever be born. Though he was a Rhodes Scholar, a member of the Literati and the Glitterati, with contemporaries and colleagues and collaborators such as James Baldwin, Alvin Ailey, Lorraine Hansberry, Tally Beebe, and Catherine Dunham. He always brought the Jamaican and Caribbean people with him in all our hues. Butu to bourgeois, petit bourgeois, he centered us all. Our esteemed panelists today are among the beneficiaries of Professor Nettleford's legacy, and they continue his teachings and his inquiry into the depths of Jamaican culture through dance theater. 
Marlon D. Sims is the artistic director of the National Dance Theater Company of Jamaica. Succeeding former artistic director Barry Moncrief in 2018. He has appeared as lead in several seminal works, including Spirits at a Gathering, Ritual of Sunrise, This Poem, and Kumina. He holds a Master's of Fine Arts in Choreographic Theory and Practice from Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Among his most critically acclaimed works are Beres on Love, a tribute to reggae superstar Beres Fred Hammond. He has taught and conducted workshops in choreography, technique, performance, dance education, within the Caribbean with an aim to develop dance in the region. Between performing and directing the company, he co-produces NDTC's journal and oversees the company's trainee program and education and, and its education arm. He is also the current Dean of School of Dance at the Edna Manley College of Visual and Performing Arts. Welcome Marlon. Hi, how are you doing? Nice to see you. So good to see you. So happy to have you. Oh, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for the invitation. What an honor. Thank you. The honor is ours. Artistic director and founder of Jamaican Dance Aggregation and Company, Neela Ebanks holds ma a Master of Arts in Physical Theater from Royal Holloway University of London and the University of Surrey a Bachelor of Science in Sociology from the University of the West Indies, and a Certificate in Dance Theater and Production from the Edna Manley School of Dance. Her diverse Jamaican and Caribbean connections include her present work with the Edna Manley School of the Performing and Visual Arts as the school's dance director and director of um, studies in acting as well as work with Continuum Dance Project, the Stella Maris Young Adult Dance Ensemble, the University Dance Society, LADACO, United Caribbean Dance Force, Dance Theater of Yameka, Ashe Performing Arts Company, and the National Dance Theater Company of Jamaica. Internationally, Neela has also represented Jamaica in the Biennial de Dance the Danza del Carib Carib, the Caribbean Educative Arts Festival, Tobago Contemporary Dance Festival, and Cari Festa 13, and Outburst Queer Arts Festival. She is a dynamic speaker, as you will see today, a real light bearer in the line of the great Champong Nani, Sojourner Truth, so many great. Uh, women that she falls in the line of. Welcome, Neela Evans. Oh, greetings, 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 everyone. Thank you so much, Akiba. Oh, your words bless my heart. It's great to be here. <laughs> so happy to have you. Orville Expression Hall, aka Dancehall Professor, is the artistic director of theater expressions, dance expression. He served as the chief judge on Dancing Dynamite on television Jamaica TVJ for 15 years and a radio host on Jamaica's Fame FM for 10 years. He is also the creative director for Dance Hall Hostel in Kingston, Jamaica. You know, that Dance Hall Hostel is very, very hard to get into. It's always, I'm, I've been trying to get, it, get it to stay there for years. So, you know, it's a very successful venture. Mr. Hall is the writer director of the world's first Dance Hall musical, from then till now, and the creator and producer of the YouTube series, The Bartender, which can be found on Expressions JA's YouTube channel. He has toured over 35 countries teaching and lecturing about dance hall. Mr. Hall is the recipient of the Gregory Isaacs Foundation Award for International Contribution to Dance by the Jamaican Reggae, Associate, Reggae Industry Association. Jaria in February of 2020. He is also the vice president of the Jacksontown Citizens 
Association. Welcome, Orville. Blessed love. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. We are truly honored. And when we say esteemed panel, this is an esteemed panel. You know, I, before we jump into the conversation, I really have to big up Miss Nadine Rollins again, because <laughs> we talk about first class, world class, universe boss. Are you that, Nadine? Are you that? All right? All right. So I want to jump into the con conversation here. Marlon, your entry into the career, into your professional career as a choreographer began in the dance hall rather than at the ballet bar, like most choreographers and artistic directors. Tell us, how has dance hall influenced your development um, personally and professionally? Well, how much time do I have? <laughs> Um, I think to really understand its impact on my life, I would have to say, for instance, what I believe it means. And um, for me, dance hall means, and I'm talking about someone who started dancing in high school, and what was happening around me was really dance hall. And I lived next door to a dance hall. So I'd be kept up late at night because people were venturing back and forth into dance hall. So I knew all the latest tunes. And of course, my family that was very conservative did not allow me to be out late. So my room became the dance hall because I get the sound from next door. And so my that was my christening, so to speak, to dance hall. And of course, the interest in what happened there really caused me to dig deep into what it was about, learning the dances that came out of that space. So what does dance hall mean to me? It means inventiveness. It means creativity. It means freedom. That kind of liberation that comes from self-discovery, claiming your body as your own, because nobody could tell me I didn't have what I have when I was in my own space doing my own thing. It was mine to celebrate. And I believe that dance all meant that. It meant that it's a celebration of self. It also meant the prowess because you get to know how far you can stretch your imagination, how far you can stretch your body physically to do some of the things that um, are now being done. Some are a bit extreme for me at my age. <laughs> but it's the extent at which you will go to be creative and try new things and be inventive. It also means enjoyment. There, that space is filled with so much joy that when you go there with your friends and you see people you haven't seen in a long time, the music is playing and you're, you know, you're partaking certain um, activities within that space, it becomes that fulfillment almost of your purpose. And in that space, you know who you are as a Jamaican, as a Caribbean. And that for me is a fulfillment that comes with the dance hall space. The music that you hear becomes an extension of your life. You know, yeah. it is yeah. what you hear. Your, your story becomes told in the music and you get these messages from the music sisters, you know, those persons who have come before you, who have passed and left their legacy through the music. And so you learn about the culture through the movements and through the music. Um, so the music connects you to your past, to your history, and to the movement of, of our people. Now, another thing that interests me is the body politics, the man-woman story relationship that comes out in a dance hall between how a man relates and how a woman relates and who a woman is and how they actually match their wits in quotation, through the movement. And that becomes the assertion of who they are, that sort of confidence that is built in the space and the rivalry that helps you to dig deeper into finding out who you are because you have to stand up in that space and be counted. And I love the dance hall space for that. It also means companionship. I mean, we can talk about people who meet each other in dance hall and end up in long lasting relationships mm -hmm. because the space becomes one where you meet new people and exchange ideas. It is a lived experience. Where are, you, where are you from? Who are you? What do you bring to the space? What do you learn from the space? What do you leave behind in the space? Yeah. And how dance hall becomes a space for this evolution of self. And that's what I love about it. Now it's a power play as well, because there's a gender power play happening in the space. Oppositional forces where they meet and collide, um, where certain government policies might be challenged in the space. Mm -hmm. And so it's the people's voices that rise up against certain ideas, philosophical ideas, ideological ideas, political ideas, and the space becomes where you hear the voice of the people. And there is a kind of dominance in a conversation that comes out of the music, out of the movement, and out of the identity of the people where things have to be challenged, where things have to compete. Um, I also believe that it's, a, it's an economic space that gives people hope. Mm -hmm. You can earn, you can make a living. 
that space re-energizes a community. It energizes a community because of all this, all the activities that take place around dance hall, the, the sound selector, the, the, the sellers, the fashion industry. So it becomes a space of hope because people earn from it and people make a living from it and becomes a lived experience. So you move from one dance hall space into the next to kind of generate this. No, I'm not going to take too long because I know you have two other speakers. I believe that dance is about finding your voice, that creative voice, the voice of identity, and importantly, the voice of affirmation, which gives the space for the people to speak, for the people to become visible, and important for the people to become heard. You know, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. And when you talk about being christened in the dance hall, and when we talk about the ecology, what you've, you, you didn't only lay out your personal and professional um, imprint, uh, dance hall's imprint in your life personally and professionally, you've actually laid out the socioeconomic ecology of dance hall. And for many of us, probably if you're born in J Jamaica, to some extent, a christening, a birthday party, definitely a wedding, you're going to have a, a dance hall. So when you talk about the music coming through the walls, the music coming through the, the, win, the, the windows in your room, and, and that christening, I remember, you know, my seventh birthday party, and it was a, a, a kiddie party, but by seven o'clock, the, 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 the sound system would go up, and all of a sudden, you thought it was stone love in the yard. It was just a record. So you never got a chance to miss dance hall to a certain extent. Neela, what does dance hall mean for you? When and where do you enter? Let me tell you something. So um, dance hall for me initially was what you don't call a guilty pleasure. Let me tell you why. My family, very Christian, very conservative, nowhere near dance hall at all. No dance hall could have played at this house. But I had dance. And I had people like Patsy Ricketts and Monica Lawrence teaching me dance and bringing music from all over the place and making sure that as a young dancer, as a, as a, as a um, preteen, I was being introduced to a number of different kinds of music. On top of that, of course, we go to school. I have friends, I hear from my friends in my bar cassette. And so dance hall became the thing that I would listen to on my Walkman while everybody else in my house was like, you know, every, everything is going on fine. I mean, one time actually, um, I borrowed my father's Walkman and I was listening to a Shabba cassette. I'll just leave it right there. It was not a pleasant time in the house. But meaning that there was, there was something about it that resonated for me um, that actually performed even, even a kind of a, maybe a kind of a spiritual function that I didn't realize just yet. There was something that was happening, something that I knew about myself as a mover, as someone of African origin, um, of someone who, who wanted to, to hear things that were youthful and energetic and, and on the pulse and on a pulse that I wasn't even necessarily living, recognizing from early on that there are many different Jamaicas, there are many different realities and happenings. And if you're not careful, you get caught up only in one. Dance hall allowed me to understand others. Yes. Really, really allowed me to understand others. Um, there came a point in time when I was becoming a, a young feminist and womanist, and I used to fight myself because here comes Bujo Banton talking about girl for big. I said to myself, Lord of mercy, this rhythm sweet. It's sweet, it's sweet, it's sweet, it's sweet, it's sweet, it's sweet. About girl for big. And why, why was girl for big and Bujo Banton? a fight for you? What were you battling with, with the lyrics of that song? If you can just give us a little content. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. I can't. Let me, let me, okay. <laughs> all right, listeners. So I cannot go into the fullness of it, but basically he's speaking about sex and the fact that it must be so good that the girl must beg, right? Me as a young girl, um, you know, 16 year old now, love the rhythm, love Buja Bantan, voice upon the rhythm, Love the quality and the tone and the rhythmicality of him voice upon the rhythm, but find myself on the dance floor with my friend them doing this. Boy, I'm not knowing I come in a really thing, said this big thing, I understand. Not understanding the fullness of it. So, so, so it also became early out for me, a kind of a political space where I would actually have to filter some of the things and think about them and say, all right, I understand this is somebody's reality, but is this where I think everything could and should be? 
So it, I, never, ever, I never accepted everything wholesale necessarily, but I was able to listen and filter and agree and disagree. So it becomes that space of, of dialogue, even for myself, with my friends and myself from early out. I always joke and say that dance hall for Jamaica is like a Kama Sutra because there is also the aspect of it now that tells you what your parents are not going to tell you about what you need to be doing in the bedroom. So there is, there's a way in which it, it's almost like a, it, it, it lays out sometimes a little bit too bare and sometimes, you know, everybody not really belong in everybody's bedroom. But at the very least, it is where you can go for certain kind of information, right? Um, for me as a maker, and as an aficionado and love of everything that comes out of the roots of us, dance hall is a space of regeneration. There are some things that can only be said through the music and the bodies of dance hall. And I don't mean, I don't mean the bodies of dance hall that put it on stage like I do, or that as a choreographer as I am would extrapolate from to create an abstract. I mean the bodies of dance hall those who are living the dance hall experience. I would never say that I live the dance hall experience. I would be lying if I did, but I appreciate it from all of the angles. And I am concerned and I care for it too, because there are ways in which some things, remember I was saying that it has it had come to me also as a space of challenge, um, a space of questioning. Mm -hmm. And there are some kinds of things that I wonder if, in as much as it's very important, it's critical to hear what is going on. It's also critical to hear what you want. It's also critical to vision, like a Bob Marley would have vision in, in voice, word sounds power. And so now I think there's another level now. I think there's a, a corner that beloved dancer can turn, but it's a corner of responsibility. Right. So that those who are there at the head, because those who are at the head, you know, those who are driving dance hall, them smart, you know. I mean, I don't just mean in terms of lyrics. I, turn, I mean, of course, in terms of intellect, you have all kinds of intellects. So there's a way in which dance hall also is a space of challenge for me but I embrace it all. You know, it's a space of dialogue. It is certainly a space of our centering, as Marlon said, is that we have the right, it's ours to celebrate, all of us, no matter what hue, no matter what anybody wants to call social status, yeah? And we have to respect it. We have to respect it too because it is carrying the DNA of things before. It is carried, just like I carry my DNA. You know, some of, I mean, I can even trace it back. But it is carrying the DNA of reggae music. It's carrying the DNA of Kumina and Buru. It's carrying the DNA of the people who came over who are stolen from the various parts of the continent to come over here to, the, to, the, to, the, to Jamaica. And so in that regard, we have to respect it and to look and see where it is going to evolve to now. And maybe now we can have a more, we can have a more um, deliberate approach as to its evolution, to use it for the kind of healing that it can be. It provides, it provi provides, um, stability and grounding financially and economically, as Marlon said, for a number of stakeholders in Jamaica. But there's also a grounding that is spiritual. There's also a grounding that is social. And I think actually that culture, culture thinkers need to come together with, with makers within the dance hall to say, look here, where are we going? How are we going to use this to transform Jamaica? Because that is where the transformation is actually going to be. So it's a lot of things for me. Um, and I, what it is for me is excitement. At the end of the day, I'm excited about dance hall always because it is newness, it is freshness, it is richness. It is a, a bubbling over of, there is, a, there is an Anansi story. You know, Anansi is um, one of the bequests from Ghana. We have received um, Anansi as the spider, right? The spider man who is a trickster, who, is, who, who gets between the, the black and the white and makes the gray. And there's a story about him and this pot that keeps making food no matter what. Just keeps making food, keeps making food. Dance all is like that. Yes. But we have to hear the rest of the story. Be careful now, because that will bust you. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Well, That's my piece. I'm so <laughs> glad you went into that Anansi story. Because when you think about the parables, right? When we think about folklore, right? Even if you listen to a beanie man, you know, even if you listen to popcorn or exactly. the, one I, the one I love these days, the skilly bang, you hear mm -hmm. them in these parables, you know? Yeah. Also, you're the dance hall professor. You're the one that's working and living and really representing the form more than any of us on this panel right now. When and where does dance hall enter your life? How, is it, how has dance hall influenced you personally and professionally? All right. Um, I always tell people that I don't 
I don't dance dance all I am dance all I was born in the dance oh, wow. that's yeah that's that's my place that's um who I am that's what gave me a voice so um when I hear Marlon talk about um that self expression I can identify immediately with it because that is how I was able to express myself even before I started expressing myself verbally you know so um my parents started the first dance hall session in the community that I I grew up it was the first yard that had a television people used to just pack up in the yard watching television when there was a dance hall session there was people from the communities around that came here so i was raised in dance hall and it is what helped me to be able to speak to the rest of the world you know um i've i've seen the struggles that that dance hall the dance hall people have to go through and as much as i can appreciate the fact that it's also a space that we can we can earn from because people get them entire liberty from dance hall i was there with people being oppressed and having to fight their way through to to be able to to earn just to keep a dance hall session and and you know how political division um even though political division had us living apart it was always the dance hall session that was able to bring us back together you know so a guy would sneak from over a pnp side to go over a glp side just for go on dance hall party and vice versa the 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 two political parties on the island the pnp and the people's mm. national party and the jlp the J- jamaica labor party and and for many mm. years especially in the 70s and the 80s mm. there were wars yeah man so yeah, that traveling were... from one side to the next could be very dangerous 1980 represented the, the uh, one of the bloodiest election that jamaica has ever seen mm-hmm. and this was this was the 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 birth of the dance hall era here in jamaica this is this is when we started to evolve and come into what dance hall was this is where we started to decide that we are no with reggae music because i i i was i was it was a time for me when we were just evolving into dance hall and when reggae in my yard my father was a part of 12 tribe of israel so in my yard all the drums used to play and the rasta man them used to come and chant and burn them chalice and mm-hmm. you know play drums that's where I learned to play drums the first time and we we listened to reggae and understood that reggae was the voice of the people and the heartbeat of the people and we were talking to people through the lyrics for them to understand the plight that we were going through but then when we got to dance hall we decided that we were going to get blatant and we were going to speak our truth in the most crass way because it's the only other way that we think that people could understand us you know so if it is sex we're going to speak blatantly about sex and if it, and if it's if it's about the gun we were talking about things that that was happening in our society we were talking about things that was happening up the road from us down the road from us across from us so when there's there's always a passion in my voice when it comes on to talking about dance hall because i saw how classism divided us and how classism allowed some people to speak about dance hall in a, in a in a more scholar type way but the reality of what was happening to us in the in the in the inner cities was still not paid attention to when the voice of the people was always dance hall when the the, the mass was always dance hall and we refused to listen because it was at a time when um you couldn't patwa was not something that was acceptable if you talk patwa then that means that you know, the, the, the the hardcore jamaican language mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so it was for me when when i when i was leaving st richard's primary school i failed my first common entrance and i was sick for my second common entrance and i left and i went to edith dalton james secondary that was in duhaney park and if it wasn't for that that's that's where dan saved my life because my youngest brother went to kalabar and me i was seen as it wasn't intentional but it was unintentionally i was now the the black sheep i was now the outcast because the community would rally around to send my brother to school 
because he was now one of them that was uplifting the face of the community by going to a high school. And I was now shipped off to one of the volatile communities in Jamaica, which was Duhaney Park and Edith Dalton James. And the only, the only thing I had that made me feel worthy of anything at all was, was dance and dance hall. So while students were in class, I would go into the auditorium and just dance and just all of the, all of the reggae music and the dance hall music of the 80s is what I would do. And that is when I started to get some amount of visibility. And even when I left Edith Dalton James um, Secondary School, I could not get a job of any worth with a SSC, which is a secondary school certificate. And I was out into the world um, as a dancer trying to get a name for myself. And I did not go back to college until I was 30 years old. I was 30 years old when I went to, to um, Exit Community College and I didn't have a subject. I didn't have any kind of CXC subject. All I had was XSC. Let me do a little bit of framing because for those who are not, raised or educated in the Caribbean school system or the British school system, when you mm. leave primary school, which is up until about middle school, to get mm. into um, a good high school, you have to take entrance exams, which Jamaicans call the common entrance or mm. what are some of the, I don't know, it was called the common entrance when I was there. What did they call it? It was common entrance. I think common it's entrance. what I'm calling so it JSAT now. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I think they call it GSAT now. GSAT. So you have to take these, these exams. So some of us, we have them here, the, the, SA, the SSATs, which will get you into a really mm -hmm. good um, high school. And if mm -hmm. you don't pass, if you, 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 you have to pass subjects, English, math, science. And if you don't pass, depending on how many subjects you get, how many you pass, mm -hmm. it determines mm -hmm. the type of high school that you go to and essentially yes. the type of life that you will have thereon. Mm -hmm. So here you are, you didn't pass with any great and great number of subjects. So you now have to go to a, a school that is less resourced and um, will give you less access as far as your career. And you find mm -hmm. a career in dance hall. Yes, that's exactly what I did. And it wasn't until um, I, I was making a name for myself in dance hall. In 1998, I choreographed every single dance piece that went into the national stadium when Jamaica was campaigning for the World Cup. I was the youth that, before everybody know, know the name Orville Expression, they know the Ross and the 20 girls that run out on the stadium field. That's how they used to say it, yeah? Um, and it, it was the same year, it was that year that a friend said to me, you are going to waste yourself away if you continue to just give your talent away without a formal education. I mean, I say, how oh, may I get a formal education in any institution without having CXC subjects? They demand that you have CXC subjects. And it was the same year that I begged my way into Exed Community College. And and if I big up Patsy Ricketts, if I big up Mr. Kenny Salmon, who said to me, I will get you into the program, but you have to do the CXCs on the side. And I did that. And um, that is when I got into the program and I was doing the subjects on the side and I ended up becoming the dance um, lecturer for Exit Community College, dance hall lecturer, helping to write the, the first dance hall course that existed at Exit. And the only issue I had with Exit is that they didn't want to call it dance hall. They wanted to call it urban contemporary folk. And I said, no, I want a dance hall course outline. And when I left Exit, um, less than two months ago, after rewriting a dance hall course outline, I now have a dance hall course outline that is accredited by heart, NC Tivet. So um, it's, it's, it's extremely passionate for me because when I tell people that dance hall saved my life, there are so many different channels I could have taken. When I was a youth and my brother was going to Calabar High School, when I was at Edith Dalton James, we wore green tie, Calabar color tie is green and black. I used to use black pen to write, to, to draw the, the, the stripe on my tie because wow. you, were look, you were looked down on going to a secondary school at that time, especially if you have a, a brother that went to a high school. So I carved a niche. So when I speak to youngsters now about the power of dance hall, especially 
the fact that I've been a part of Dancing Dynamite for so many years and hear dancers complain about um, dancers not getting enough um, visibility or respect. We have to be a part of that change. We have to be a part of how we propel dance hall forward, how we make people sit dance hall. And there's a certain level of self-respect that we have to take within ourselves and a certain amount of knowledge. I realize that dance hall has to come from somewhere. This is how I started educating myself about things that existed before, or traditional folk forms, mentor, scare, rock, steady, reggae, 80s dance hall, 90s dance hall, up to where we are today. So it's just a lifesaver for me. I would used to, used to lock gun as a youth. They used to give me them gun for lock as a little youth. Wow. That, is a, that is a road that I could have taken and dance, tell me, say, dance all said, if you ever want to be a complete, not a failure in your life and you want to elevate yourself, the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning is dance. The last thing before I go to my bed is dance. So this is what I must be doing. Mm. Wow. Three incredible stories. Powerful, yeah. dynamic stories of your entrance and your relationship currently with Dancehall. Hearing how this art form for you, Orville, transformed your life and, and it, it Listening to you three, um, um, it puts me in the mind of hip hop culture. Now I know, yeah. I know that I may end up stepping on some toes with my fellow dancehall purists because we don't like the comparison and all of that. And I'm a dancehall purist, but I want to talk a little about dancehall and hip hop because many people say hip hop comes from dancehall, but hip hop doesn't come from dancehall. Hip hop mm. and dancehall are parallel movements. That has always yeah. been here. Mm -hmm. And it is the compression, as you all are explaining, it is the compression of the experiences that we, we encountered being the descendants mm -hmm. of the transatlantic slave trade that gives us and leads us to hip hop and dancehall. And they mm -hmm. intersect, if you notice, during the 60s with, with, with the most yeah. because dancehall, the roots of dancehall is sky rock steady which is, mm -hmm. is converging. In the new world, we have a convergence of the Black Americans in the American South, in, in the industrial North, creating this music that is called blues R&B. Yeah, in the Caribbean, we are listening to this blues R&B coming off of the radio. And we are inspired. Bob Marley was, and the Whalers was an R&B um, quintet when they started. Yeah. And something mm -hmm. happens around the time of Jamaica's independence in 1962. And it's yes. also what is happening because we're seeing um, JFK is in the 60s, JFK is, is assassinated. Dr. King is assassinated. Malcolm mm -hmm. X is assassinated. Medgar Evers is assassinated. There's Steve Biko. There is a lot happening in the world at this time. And the creativity creates, it, it, it converges in these two kind of uh, global centers of the United States and the Caribbean, but we get hip hop coming out of funk, right? And bebop, mm -hmm. and we get dancehall coming out of reggae, rock mm -hmm. and something happens in the late seventies around the time that we, the panelists were born and continue yeah. throughout the eighties and it's dancehall and it's hip hop and they're working as parallel movements and everything you, that you have described here in your stories, we see in both cultures. So I do want yeah, to talk into that space for a second. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's a, it's, it's, it's two groups of people telling their story based on what they were experiencing at the time. And that is why both exploded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's just demographic that changed it. I mean, in the US, there's a bigger space that could lift hip hop to a certain level. But dancehall and reggae was the voice that had to be heard. It had to be heard we, when we were. It was a, it was a pain and it was a pain and the social issues that was happening to people in reggae music that make people and this dynamic way that reggae was played 
when people talk about scan, we can know that so the emphasis of scan is on the second and fourth beat. One, two, three, four. But reggae knows that third beat where people could one, two, three, four. And that is why we get that kind of grounded something in our bodies. But it was it was what we were living that was coming out into the music that had to be heard. So it's, it's really two groups of people that were oppressed, that were, were speaking to their music and their dance moves that just exploded onto the world stage. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you talk about, I'm going to talk about the one drop. You talk about that third beat. We mm -hmm. in reggae music, we in dance, I'll call it the one drop. I'm going to talk about the one drop. But yeah. what I want to do next is I want to bring in Nettleford, the great Professor Nettleford. Neela, as a former student of Professor Nettleford at UEMONA, when and where does Professor Rex Nettleford enter the conversation on dance hall? How does he, he intersect? as a scholar and as a, a very highbrow artist, mm -hmm. global artist, how does he intersect dance hall culture? Wow, okay, so so Professor Nettleford, um, as an artist scholar, scholar artist, because it's all one, um, he, he, I mentioned earlier, had a love affair with all kinds of music, right? I mean, all kinds. In fact, if you wanted to find new music, you'd be able to find it from going to the, the seasons of dance of NDTC because he would have found something, something new. You hear Miriam Makeba's voice. You hear some Huma Sakel over here. So you hear some Peter Tosh. You hear a Jimmy Cliff you've never heard before. And then you take it and you use it in festival because you love it so much, But um, which is a competition that happens annually in Jamaica. But he was a man of, of many musical loves and he brought that into his space to speak about whatever he had to speak about on stage. Um, but that was also coming from him understanding the real center of Caribbean power and the real center of Jamaican power. And that center is ourselves. When I was at UWE as an undergraduate student, I remember having to read, and it wasn't for his course, but we had to study him in Caribbean political thought, rightly so. We also studied Bojo. And um, we, he, he wrote an article, well, it's a chapter called Battle for Space in the seminal book, Inward Stretch, Outward Reach, right? Man, I love that book. And that particular chapter just kind of opened my eyes as to Jesus and peace. This is who I have to be as a Jamaican artist. This is what I have to know as a Caribbean artist. I am actually at the center and everything else is peripheral. A lot of times what we have been taught, especially because we are still living in colonial legacy in as much as we call ourselves post-colonial, right? Mm -hmm. Is that we must look to a metropole we are small island and we're always looking outside. We know what is going on over there. We know what's happening over there. So we're aware of all the news. We want the latest trends. And that kind of outward stretch before you act, well, outward reach before you actually do an inward stretch is the problem. How much have you interrogated on the inside of what you have? How much do you love your, your bush medicines from your grandmother? Or, you know, the stories that your, that your grandfather would tell you in our native Patwa language, our Jamaican language? before you go to and try to learn somebody else's. So he, during, with his writings, with his, with his academic work, with his artistic work, was trying to turn that lens for us back onto us mm -hmm. to remind us that we are where we start. And I mean, he was not, he was not the only one, they're not the only Caribbean um, voice saying this. Lloyd Best of Trinidad and, and Tobago, um, brilliant thought leader there said, I am my own first world. I am we my are, own first world. I am my own Trinidad first world. I'm my yes, own first world. Yes, yes, I am my own first world. And when you, when you think about that and link that with how many other scholars and so on were saying the same thing, Dance was saying the same thing too. Mm -hmm. And I think Professor Nettleford also recognized that. So there was no way, for example, that reggae or dancehall would not be included in the, the, the soundtracks to the music. And I don't just mean by lyrics, you know. I, just, I also mean by, as Orville was breaking it down a while ago, about the rhythms, because the rhythms are telling the story already. The rhythms give you the idea about what is going on already. Where that emphasis drops says something different every time you hear it. Then you add the layer of the melody, add the layer of the lyrics. And Professor understood that very well. He worked with Miss Wiley, Miss Wiley, Marjorie Wiley, um, for so many years as musical director in terms of crafting the music, whether it was done live or done um, recorded, dance hall, reggae, whatever it was. He crafted it to be able to tell the story that he wanted to tell. And there was no piece of music that was beyond reach or below. You know, there was no below for him. There was only center. Um, and so I found, 
the kind of example that he gave also as this artist scholar, very, very secure in self, um, which made other people uncomfortable. And that is the thing, when you are centered in yourself, so many are going to be uncomfortable. Think about dance hall. Think about how many people in dance hall are centered in themselves. They're living their, them living them life. And there are so many outside who are so uncomfortable with that. When you live and sit in your authenticity and you use your authenticity, um, authenticity to rise, those who thrive on being inauthentic are going to be very upset. And so he knew that, you know, so he amplified dance hall in, in works. He amplified dance hall in thought and philosophy. He amplified reggae music. He amplified kumina and other traditional forms. His was the thing of amplification of what belongs to us so that we understand that it's not about us being on par with, with anybody else in the galaxy. We just are who we are. And then eventually, just like the sun, they will orbit and they will come. Wow. Mm -hmm. I am my own center. Lloyd I am best. my own first world. I am my own first world. No, the, the developmental psychologists teach you mm -hmm. that the child's first place of belonging is in the home. Yes. The child's first love, love is the mother. Mm -hmm. The mother of the father, the first, the caretaker, the caregiver, who centers them in their lives. And in passing on, and the beauty of what you're saying here, Neela, is dance all allows us to... Uh, is a vehicle that allows mm -hmm. us to, to enter into our own centering. We're going to talk yeah. about yep. movements in a minute. I'm going to try to control my little body here and, and not why. No, 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 don't, don't. I'm, it's I'm a part of the dialogue. Very professional and keep it steady. But <laughs> before we go into the movement and the body parts, we're going to talk with Marlon about. You worked with Dr. Nettleford. You are only the third artistic director of the NDTC, which was founded in 1962, 63? Am I getting right? Around the time of Jamaica's independence. So you really are a torch bearer of a legacy that predates ne um, Nettleford. But now you hold that and you worked with him and, and you studied with him. Tell us about what Nettleford meant for the NDTC and how that showed up in Denzel. And then I also want you to talk a little bit about, as we talk about centering ourselves, you did a piece of choreography to one of my favorite Tiger songs. <laughs> <laughs> when? <laughs> so we, that song, you think about the lyrics of that song. That is a song that really talks about centering and grounding and rooting. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the one drop in a minute. But Marlon, talk to us about working with Dr. Nettleford and then carrying his baton into the 21st century. Well, I mean, I can tell you that when I first met Professor Nettleford, um, way back when I was a student at the University of the West Indies, I never imagined that I would have been leading the NDTC today. And um, this is someone who I'd always heard about. I'd always see the NDTC on television, um, always admired the company. But I was just, I just felt as though I was several light years away in terms of that particular generation. And um, having a foray into the company, it was just not in my thinking. However, my entry into dance, which was through dance hall music and through my first uh, performance in dance hall as a part of that audition in high school doing Tiger's Win, seemed to have been what has been a, a part of my self discovery and a part of my artistic interest into always infusing dance all in what I do. And I believe that that became more evident and more profound in my life after I met Professor Nettleford. In fact, every year, third year students at the University of the West Indies, I know you, um, Nila was I do at the time, you have to do what is called a Tyrant Studies if you're in an arts, arts faculty. And he was my supervisor. And I can't remember the first time I met him because, you know, you have to make an appointment to see him because he's busier than the Pope. And I made an appointment with the secretary. And I remember um, I went to the office when it was time. I remember I was extremely nervous because this is a man who was just so iconic that you couldn't even envision him in the flesh. And I went to his office and I waited with the secretary on the outside. And then she says, you know, you can go in. And when I went to his office, he was behind a mountain of books. <laughs> on his desk and he was 
the moon, he was warm, he was welcoming, he was engaging. And let me tell you, we spoke for a very long time, actually. I listened for a very long time because I really did not know what to add to the conversation. The, 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 the expanse of his knowledge and his ability to articulate, articulate his ideas so freely was in itself just a powerful demonstration of his knowledge, his expertise and experience, and how he could communicate all of that in a small nugget on a very impressionable mind at that time. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, when he spoke to me, he needed to say no more. This man was going to become my mentor. And so I had to learn his works too because I was in the University of Dance Society. And at that time, I would dance all was my team. Yes, we had the modern, but when it comes to dance all, there was Marlon. And we were introduced to the vocabulary of the NDTC through works that were staged on us, excerpts. And that was how I began to learn the NDTC style. And then I began to make the connection between Jamaican experience um, as, as, a, as a moving culture, uh, the Jamaican experience as in the amalgamation of these forms to create art on stage, and most importantly, how this form is used to showcase Jamaican and Caribbean excellence. Mm. That for me was an important thing. And in working with him closely, I mean, I started working with him because I joined the company in 1999, one of the things that he would always make these, give these mantras and we'd have these conversations and it, you know, <laughs> he, we was famous for saying things. He didn't quite know what they meant until probably a couple of years ago we were like, oh, that's what he meant. But one of the things that stuck with me was when he said, excellence is achieved through hard work, dedication, application, commitment, sustained application, high concentration, discipline, and generosity of spirit. And let me tell you, that was a part of everything that he did. And he, in a very magical way, he was able to pull all of that out of you. How, it was about how his, he was personally able to relate to you as a human being and how he was able to see you as an individual and how he believed that the individual could bring something special to the process of creating work that in itself is about you. And so he made you feel as if your voice was important in the process of expressing this Jamaican identity. And so you felt as though you were part of something that was greater than you and something that was far more important because you have this vested interest in putting your voice in a mass of voices that have to come out of the, the, the Caribbean to kind of speak about the excellence that can only be found here. And now I'm say that it is, I, I, am, I, I really just think I have one totally shoe because you can only be professor once and professor never is professor never thought. And so it's really an esteem honor to be carrying the company on this particular leg of the journey because now we have to look at what the legacy is and we have to look about what our generation is doing with this particular legacy. And we have to also look at how he was able to help us shape our artistry. I remember once I was doing a work and I was, to be honest, I was looking at home you know, I was looking towards North America and Europe because I was like, okay, what can I draw on to kind of inform my creative process? And I remember he pulled me aside and he said, Marilyn, come here. You know, he had a nice little accent. I've seen your work, but um, I think you should look closer to home. Mm. And let me tell you, I never, I've, not, I've never forgotten that conversation and it was a turning point for me because it was his way of refocusing my attention on what we have. And the important things within our culture that need to be recognized and need to be celebrated. And he also had to refocus me because I think it was his way of saying the introspection and celebration of our people ha have to continue, right? It does not stop with him. And it, 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 just, it, it just stayed with me. And so I must tell you, when I, I'm in a very difficult spot and thinking about, oh my goodness, what do I do? I don't say, what do I do? I say, what would Professor do? <laughs> how, we would, how would he handle the situation? And fortunately for us, he has left so many writings and research and thoughts and philosophies and ideologies and ideas about how we can be so rooted in our culture and how we can take what we're rooted in to help to develop who we are as an individual 
how we can better serve our families, how we can better serve our community, and how we can better serve our Jamaican and Caribbean society. And it is always those writings and those researches that we go to the, the, to get that intellectual for that information that we sometimes need to embolden our confidence to put forward some creative and artistic ideas that we know will continue his work, will continue the work of the art form, will continue the work within the, the culture so that certain things are not forgotten. I must tell you too, I know I'm saying that in a very short time, that professor also believed that in the history of music and reggae is the ideas of the Jamaican people. So I believe that he was using his time over his period as 48 years as artistic director of the NDTC to find those nuggets of ideas within the music to bring onto the stage and crafting these ideas mm -hmm. on the bodies to express them. And for him, that was just not enough through movement. So you had to bring the live component because that's an important part of our African ancestry, music and dance go together. So you had the live music, he had the music, the singers as a part of that expression, and then he had the dancers. And together, they presented what is most, what is strongest in our culture, which is the African retention of the relationship between music and dance. Now, he had a struggle, I believe, with finding that balance between doing recorded music, because he loved certain artists, and I name a few. He loved Two Sibert, loved Bob Marley, Love Papa Lee, the Gregory Isaacs, Jimmy Cliff, Burning Spray, Peter Tosh, Freddie McGregor. And he also loved Buju Banton. God, the Sita come, you know. Mm -hmm. Come with the Buju. We're going to talk about it. <laughs> Love Buju Banton. And he would always try to find thematic ideas within the music of these voices coming out of um, that particular aspect of our culture to bring life to the movements and the stories that he had to tell. You know, dance was like a canvas to him. You know, the bodies are like canvases um, and movement in poetry. But most importantly, he had to, the, the sort of philosophical ideas that he had had to resonate through the performance and it had to cross the footlights into the hearts and minds of the people. Mm -hmm. So when you leave that theater at the end of an NDTC performance, you're not only celebrating what you saw on stage, you're celebrating yourself. Mm -hmm. Because there was no, nothing more profound than seeing black bodies of all shapes and sizes who look like you on the stage celebrating things that you do on a daily basis that you may not, may not have thought of as being as excellent as anything else across the world. And for people who is coming, coming, coming from hundreds of years of suffering and separation and, 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 and discrimination and all kinds of atrocities Professor Redford knew that it was important for people to see themselves and to see the goodness within themselves. And so I think from a very early point in his life, he recognized his purpose. And it was something that he had to do. And he also ensured that the job that he started had to continue. And so when he knew and this is, that's why some people say our professors are obvious man enough, but he himself said it as well. Mm. When he recognized that he was going up in years, he started a succession planning. And he died in 2010, but as early as 2005, probably early on, he started the mantra, renewal and continuity. Renewal because he recognized that there were generations coming up behind him. Mm. Continuity because the dance and the work that he started had to continue. And I'm gonna leave it there for now. You know, I'm, I'm gonna, I've been carrying a, a little secret in my heart for 20 years. Now I know I don't look old enough, but <laughs> I, I met Dr. Nettleford in 2020. I was on mm -hmm. a small delegation of US students who took an intercession course at the University of the West Indies called Jamaica Today. Yeah. And we, we were a group, um, in the group were a group of African-American girls. We were black girls. And there came a point where we were feeling very pressed as, as, as black girls in the group. Um, Nettleford, without we, knowing, we were to go to a lecture and we had never met him. 
and um, we we had our dashikis on and our, you know, we're in Jamaica, so we're putting on our colors. We're really showing up black power. We, it's the closest thing to Africa that we had at the time. And he comes up behind us and he says, look at the adornments of these African queens. <laughs> and I tell you, it was like fresh rain water on a desert sand. It was so needed. Somebody needed to, it, we, were, we were so pressed. Yes. And we needed the loving that day. And here comes this voice behind us. Look at the adornment on these African queens. And, <laughs> you know, eventually he did the lecture and, and he, he said something to me, which, you know, I, I'll, keep, I'll keep it in my heart, but I'll tell you, Nettleford sent me here. I'm a big Afrofuturist. Yes, yes. And in 2020, in, in 2000, on the steps of the Sherlock, um, as you walk into, go into the Philip Sherlock Center at the University of the West Indies, which is a, 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 a theater uh, um, on the, the uni, uni, university's campus, um, he said something to me. And um, I'll never forget what he said, and it brought me here. So all of what, you know, when I call him the godfather of Jamaica's culture, you, I hope our listeners and the people who are studying and learning about Jamaica understand why, why I've dubbed him that. Mm -hmm. Going now into movement, um, so much of what you say, what you're all saying, but what you said, um, Marlon, resonates um, as far as where, where the culture is. What, I want to talk a little bit about the sound mm -hmm. and movement, sound. So Rastaman said word, sound, power. Word, sound, power is a huge part of reggae, is a huge part of dancehall. And movement, the physicality. And I know all three of y'all can take this question to the moon and back. <laughs> and I want you to, so have fun. Um, I'll shorten the Q&A, don't worry. Um, but I want to talk about the sound, right? Yeah. When I hear the one drop, as Orville, you, you, you referenced it earlier, the beat on the three. So the one, it's called the one drop because you dropped the, the first beat. So it's, and one, what, I, I can't count it. I'm not a drummer. But basically they drop the first beat and it's on the third beat that the impact is sound. So when you listen to the one drop, when I hear it, I hear a work song. Mm. I hear a plow to the ground. Mm. I'm not surprised Bob Marley worked, you know, in, in, in um, the U.S. On, on mechanics. He, was, he would have heard that plow to the ground. And so when we talk about dancehall culture being rooted into the liberty of the people and the movement, the sound is in the body. Where, is, where are the physical movements in the body? I want to start, I know y'all going to take this, and I can't wait, I, but I want to talk about the actual body parts, some thoracic movements, pelvic movements, movements of the limbs. Where do the movements live on the body? Any owner take it. Go ahead. I won't point it. Anybody want to talk first, go, go with it. But where, where do the movements live and their significance of these movements? Third. Wow. Wow. Um, I, I, I want to jump in um, <laughs> because I, I, think, I think I know where they start. I think they start in here. In the heart? They start, they start in the heart. Wow. They start, they, they start in that kind, of, that kind of like fundamental resonance. And then they come out as various things through hands and through rhythms over time. Right? I'm, I'm taking this, that, that spectral view of everything. Um, where, where the movements come through has to be traced back to where the, the DNA of the movements comes from. Marlon mentioned retentions, Orville mentioned retentions. What we have in our body container is remnants of what was brought over by our generations of ancestors who held on to that rhythm information and held on to that movement information, that understanding of what the body is supposed to do and can do, what kind of portal it is for transformation. And uh, albeit four years of, 400 years of fragmentation, violence held on to it, so much so that to this day, it comes through, through dancehall, through pelvis, through spine, through, through the movement of the head in particular instances, through any part of the body that needs to speak at a certain time. But it, must, it, it is very, very relevant and related to 
traditional farms, even some of those that, that were birthed in Jamaica and traditional farms that came over from our ancestors in parts of Africa and that we kept in the, in the crucible of the body as best as possible. So it's in as much as we can, we can have that physical discussion, you know, we can talk about, you know, this movement, you'll find it there and the pelvis is central for a particular reason, which I love as well, because the reason why the pelvis is central is totally antithetical to the European part of our ancestry. It's not the pelvis, It's not erotic and it's not uh -huh. nasty and it's not base and it's not vulgar, it's life. It's, that's what it is, it's life. It is central and important to life. Mm -hmm. It is, it is, it is, it, and, and that's why it is also circular. It moves in a circular fashion. So, so anything else that comes out of that is great. But at, this, at the beginning of that, it is, it is central to life. And the fact that it's central to dance hall speaks to what dance hall is and can be to us because it is a place where you cannot repress a pelvis. Well, hmm. So for some, the pelvis is repressed and that is gender related. And that is something that can be challenged and questioned now because everybody have a pelvis. So, so and everybody pelvis supposed to can work or else life can happen. So, so you, 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 meaning, meaning look at what it is for what it is and not, not um, through the lenses of maybe a divided European consciousness. Mm -hmm. And one that us through a lens of eroticism. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, we talk about the movement of the pelvis and the, the suppression, the repression of the pelvis. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. And you talk about the spine, right? And the heart. These are, if you think about them, these, there are chakral, sh chakral systems, right? So you have a heart, you have a heart um, chakra, which is, is that what, which one is that? Now, if you count from one up, chakra are these um, points on the body that ancient people believed um, were energized, right? And then you have your first chakra is in your pelvis. Your life chakra is in your pelvis. So that's powerful. Moving in, to, I want to toss this to, to, to Orville to talk about the movements and the repression of the pelvis, especially for our men. Why are the men's pelvis repressed, repressed in? Are the Jamaican men? Let me, let me fix that question because I know shots are going to get fired at me right now. Are the Jamaican men's pelvis repressed right now? <laughs> you're muted. You're muted, Arville. Unmute. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I agree with, with Mila that this is where it starts here. Yeah. So for me, it starts in the heart and then... The pelvis is what gives it life, you know, and send it out to the world. All right. Um, it's interesting. It's it's so interesting because there are a couple of things that's associated with how a man move in waistline in a dance hall as opposed to how a woman move her waistline. The woman will always go for the 360 degree rotation, deep pelvic movement, and the man them loves to that. Um, the man them now developed a thing that we call the infinity sign, where the, the waistline does this instead of this circular movement. So it's more of an infinity sign, both of which is never ending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is what it, yeah. So the figure eight is, is what, and both movements never ending. And it is a beauty to watch those two movements collide in rubber dub. See, if I go back to looking what rubber dub is, see, when a man and woman are doing their three, three primary movements, so them using a rubber dub, you have, you, have, you have the water pump, you have the cool and deadly, and you have the slide and wine. You see it? So when, 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 when the woman use the cool and deadly waistline, the man would impress her with that figure eight waistline at the same movement, them using an S90 scan car and all of that. However, when we rear, what Based on just my own research and just you know noticing things, mm -hmm. part of the reason why um, a lot of us in dance hall couldn't relate to the whining of the waistline, we couldn't relate to the whining of the waistline, is because there are certain things we couldn't do as a youth when we grew up, right? So we when when you're comfortable, you like put on your mother's shoes and your mother just are. Really, really, as a youth, you couldn't do these things. You couldn't wind your waistline completely, full rotation in your waistline. But then 
as you get older and you start research, especially for me as a dancer, you play a whole heap of dancer people, don't do hardcore dancer people. We start realizing it is something that goes way back in our culture because Jamaica was the hub for butt breaking. See, when they used to rape, yeah, butt breaking, when they used to rape. Butt breaking. Butt breaking is when they used to rape the male slaves in front of their families. Now, if a lot of people don't know that happened here in Jamaica was the hub for book breaking in the Caribbean. So when the slaves were running away and the slave masters would capture them and kill them or lynch them, um, a slave master said, don't kill them, break them. And how they would break them is that they would spread them out and they would use um, board and wrap barbed wire on it and sodomize them in front of their families. You get to me, I say, so this was passed down to a generation that anything that anything that looks effeminate young men young, young jamaican men must not take it on it's not until me a big man me carry my my my, my fiance's purse she couldn't give me a purse for whole a youth couldn't walk and flip him hand so in in my sight when me i grew up in the inner city if a youth go so with him hand he might get beaten that is what stopped me from the first time I got to Stella Maris, I got a, a, a scholarship to go to Stella Maris. And just the fact that we got there and I see the man in a tight. And I say, it was a year after that I decided that I'm going to take on the Stella Maris thing. But no, anything that looked effeminate. So it, it, they were not broken where they wouldn't pass it down to their kids. They decided no whining, no breaking, no effeminate um, movement, no high squeaky voice no so that was taken away from us a certain freedom of movement in a city youth half of half of us cannot articulate why we are not why we are so homophobic we can't truly articulate it it was maybe six years ago that i was able to articulate it because i started to research about what working and, and understood what was happening here in jamaica and why jamaican men just decide say before me do this me just to the rock here I make my waistline move this way rather than a full circle. Yeah. But we were still able to tell that story through our waistline because you cannot break the waistline. Now, when we got to this was what was happening in the 80s, it was the figure eight waistline that was happening. And then you now when Bogle came in 1992, you no, know, Bogle gave us a different waistline. Bogle was, was a, a, a very popular choreographer of Jamaican dance hall. Of Jamaican All of the dance. dances you and, see elephant man doing. Created and by a, yeah. yeah, yeah, man. So Bogle came out now and Bogle said, Waistline, we're gonna use the waistline. And Bogle started giving the bones from left to right. Now, a part of the history of war, I will leave for the youth. Even youths were associated with Bogle, we use Bogle name for big up for them name. Never realized that Bogle they come from Donga. Well, they knew that Bogle come from Arnett Garden, but remember, when the people them come from out of St. Thomas and come in a town. I don't know, Arnett Garden with them used to forward and do them dance thing. You know. Bogus saw these kind of movements, you know. And that Arnett is why Garden Bogus. is a, a, a ghetto of Kingston, right? Yeah, man. Tough yeah, man. Area. So it, yeah. one, of the, one of the hardcore inner city areas. Mm -hmm. See? So when Bogus started watching the, them people do them humming a dance and hold a waistline, go, he started giving that, bow, that bounce. So when people even misrepresent Bogle by focusing on the hands doing this. It wasn't that. Bogle waistline. Some movements like Stucky dance and all of them things that come out of the Bogle type waistline. And if you know watch when Bujo Bantan dance, mm. when he's a DJ, at a, a big waistline movement there, Bogle. Because the first thing is nobody saw Bogle dance coming. That song from Bujo Bantan, nobody saw that coming. But he was so impressed as a dancer DJ getting into Rastafarian with just how Bogle's movement was more spiritual than effeminate. Mm. So that is how we get a Bujo Bantanado Bogle dance. I'm gonna I'm gonna step into a little bit of what may be an ant's nest, but mm -hmm. me is a Coromanti woman, so I'm a strong. I can I can yeah, man. about to come out now. We talk about um, you, you mentioned St. Thomas and what you, 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 it, it, you were speaking a little bit in code. So I have to decode for those who don't know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. When you say 
um, St. Thomas and the people them doing their dance, the Kumina. What we're talking about are yeah. the people who retain the practices of Kumina and um, which is an African um, religious practice that involves in, in um, mm -hmm. dancing and connecting to the ancestors through dance. Um, and it's yeah. frowned upon because Jamaica is, in addition to many things, um, in, it is a, a parochial society, right? A patriarchal parochial society. So the African, uh, many, many things are suppressed in Jamaica. The Africanisms, um, expression of, 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 you know, the culture does have a lot of homophobia. And when you talk about Buju, Buju is known, he has become the kind of poster child, unfortunately of homophobia in dance hall and a sour spot for many people, a sore and sour mm -hmm. spot, no matter where you are, um, even as people of Jamaica, um, queer Jamaicans love his music, but there's that song, the song that he mm -hmm. has also demonetized. Um, he yeah. uh, no longer plays the song, no longer receives any funding. And we won't talk about the song because the song is extremely harsh. But those who mm -hmm. know what we're talking about, you know, and if you don't know, go look it up. So when we talk about that, there are two places that you just hit on in our villa. We can't make, we can't just, we can't just make it it and don't speak to it. One, it is the no man, reason of our Af Africanism, and one thing is the blatant homophobia of Jamaica that has to stop because it's limiting mm -hmm. us in, it's limiting us on so many levels. I want to talk, yeah. Marilyn, and uh, talk to us as 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 men. How do you, how do we fix it? Because it's there. There's the suppression of our African culture, and there's the suppression and this very violent homophobia that that shows up, unfortunately, in the dance hall, and it is suppressing us, and it's on Black men's bodies. Talk to that. Mm -hmm. How do we fix it? How do we move forward from it? Marl um, I'll go to Marlon and then come in with it again, Orville and, and Mila. Yeah, man. I'm going to turn this over to the, the Q&A. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so you've, you've taken us there. <laughs> um, I, how do we fix it? I mean, let me go back a little bit and I, I'll, I'll talk to an experience that I had, which is similar to what Orvis experience has been growing up in Jamaica, knowing very well that you are in a homophobic environment and certain activities or certain behaviors will draw negative attention and it may evoke certain things in other persons around you, which could, um, end up harming you in several ways, physically, mentally, that kind of a thing, based on the backlash that you will receive. Some of it, you are not even fully aware of what you are doing or what you might do it might be offensive to someone else, but it just ends up being because there are certain things that are acceptable within certain spaces um, based on who has a dominant voice in that space. Now, I remember when I was a student at the University of the West Indies and I was learning, I was coming out to the dance hall experience because it was all I knew and all I cared about. Um, and then we had to learn dances, other forms of dances, modern. That's where I really got into learning modern dance. And I'd, I'd go in wear my sweatpants. I remember I had one black sweatpants. And that was my dance gear. But we were learning pieces. I remember we were learning Prophets and Edwards. Um, I think it wasn't Ritual of the Sunrise. It was, I can't remember the name of the piece now, taught by Arden Richard back then. He sent her over to the company to teach us this work. And we had to wear tights. And I remember the males in the dance were so uncomfortable. We have to wear tights, we have to wear tights, we have to wear tights. I remember we call it informal meeting. <laughs> it, was an, it was an issue. Neil was, Neil was president then. Of the Sorry, dance. Marlon. Marlon, it's Flash of the Spirit. Flash of the Spirit. Yes, Rex Network Peace. And we had an informal meeting about it because we had to talk to the choreographer because the costumes were being made and we just could not reveal ourselves to the audience in a particular light because we know that once the magic of the art form is finished and the show is over, we have to leave the stage and re-engage the public. And if we're gonna go out into go society, home. yeah, we have to go home. <laughs> and if we go out into society, we may face an awful backlash. And so we brought our concerns to the career and said, listen, the dance nice, we love it. But reality is society may not accept us on stage in a particular way. And the interesting thing was she was very, she was very um, understanding and she went and she created this brown patch <laughs> that covered the front of the costume. So it became more of a very tribal African look. 
which made us feel more secure in wearing it. And then, of course, the fabric was skin tone, so it looked like skin, and we looked like tribesmen. And we were able to wrap our mind around that representation without feeling as though people were drawn to the fact that we are wearing tights. Now, today, how do we change that? It's through conversation. And I'm not going to go as far as to say that Jamaica is the most homophobic country in the world, as some persons in the press may want to advocate or say that we are, because I believe that Jamaica is far more tolerant now than when, we, when I grew up in the 70s, 80s, and stuff like that. Um, and I think this changing through global, globalization, information, um, families that have accepted certain things uh, or, or, or behaviors, it's just about the space you're in, mm -hmm. the culture within that space, and the kind of conversations that happen in that space. What kind of conversations do I have with my students? And then young people in general, I have these conversations. How do you feel about wearing tights? They may reject it and they may say it's perfectly okay. And one of the things I ask them is, but if you don't want to wear tights because you're so self-conscious about your body, then how then can you support an Asafa Powell and Usain Bolt? Don't they wear tights on the track? And then they're able to cross-reference that, that viewpoint to say, but if they can wear it, so can I. Mm -hmm. Because they look at those individuals as the epitome of masculinity. Masculine, yeah. You and say both and a thought for power, of course. Right. And so if they're comfortable wearing tights, then mm -hmm. I guess nothing is wrong with wearing it. And very it's soon it's a man thing. Right, it's a man thing, you know. That's how you get to run fast. That's how you get to show the body. You still, still look strong. If you wear a big baggy sweatpants, you probably won't see them probably run half as fast. And so you use that kind of perspective to kind of get them to understand how certain gears that you wear are important for certain kinds of activities that you do. And it has nothing to do with your sexuality. And that's really what it comes down to. Trying to demarcate where does sexuality stop and where does the art form begin? And it is really through education. Whilst you may use the art form to express elements of sexuality because it is a part of life, we can't deny it. Mm -hmm. it, is, it does not make you what people perceive you to be. Who you are in your personal life can be completely different from who you are in the practice of the art form too. Because to be quite honest, sexualities are in every profession, not only in dance. And so the idea of it just being confined to dance as an art form is, is quite an unfair uh, perception, and it only because it, that only happens because of the visibility of the art forms. Is the point fingers it because they can see you. So I believe that in order to address the issue head on, we would have to have particular conversations within different stakeholders or different social groupings about identity, mm -hmm. about dance as an art form, about people's rights, individual rights, about, about justice, about creating space for people to be themselves and to be individuals. And these are all difficult and uncomfortable conversations. Mm -hmm. But if there is no dialogue about it, then what has happened in the past will be perpetuated. Of course. And I believe that in 2020, there's far more room now to have certain kinds of conversations that I would have never, never envisioned having in the 1980s when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. The kind of discomfort and the kind of rigid approach to understanding each other and accepting each other, there was no space for that to happen. And I go back to my earlier point, the only way that we can change the status quo or the ideas or the beliefs or the perception is to have meaningful dialogue in the spaces where this is a major issue that directly impacts people's lives, livelihood, identity, and their ability to be themselves. Mm. Orville, how do, we, how do we fix it? The, the, the constrictions around the, the black male body and also the genderization of movement, woman movement, man movement, the pelvis is, belongs to every human being. So how do we deal with that first point of life? Yes, sir. You're muted. You're muted, sir. Okay, yeah. I agree with um, Marlon holistically when, it, when we talk about the conversation, having conversation. 
Yeah. Um, that's one. Um, setting the platform for these conversations is also very important. All right. Indulge me a little bit, come here, go around the place. It's because of classism in Jamaica, it shut down a whole heap of things that should happen. We never said could happen, we said should happen. Mm -hmm. Certain conversations and certain education of the young black male mm -hmm. here in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So we are restricted to a certain sect of society where we think that what we say and how we say it will not be listened to because we are not seen as educated, see? Mm -hmm. Now, let's just go back to, um, I was introduced to the power of Rex Nettleford's work in maybe 2003, when a big man already, when I was already an adult, see? And that came through Patsy Ricketts and um, Monica Lawrence from Stella Maris. Now, even Rex Nettleford and NDTC, there, to me as a young man growing up and the friends that were around me, their portrayal of dancehall was what we saw as a watered down version. Because we felt that the focus was more on modern contemporary or ballet than dancehall. There was a rawness to dancehall that we feel was never a part of the application. It's almost like we want pretty top for the rest of the world, watch it. Mm -hmm. So instead of a wine with a pelvis, and instead of NBTC people, them wine with them pelvis, them wine with, with up here or so. And they never want to get deep rooted in it and make it look ratcha. So, and this now, I'm saying this to say that it was because of the division, because when Marlon can see um, Professor Nettleford as a man who is just always busy, we saw him as an elite where we could never get to. Yes, right. So there was, a, there was a difference now. This is where we saw classism and realized that, okay, that's why. If, them, if anybody forgot up on tour, it's it going to be quicker at NBTC than a little dance group down at the inner city and Ray because it is reserved for these elite people. Well-spoken man, a man with that influence a whole lot of people. But because of this marginalization that is happening in our society, the youth them in the inner city that should be listening to a Rex Nettleford did not get that chance to listen to him and know the power of what he's bringing. Now, everything when me do, when me start... Um, when I got introduced, because Patsy Ricketts said to me, because I told Pat, Patsy Ricketts, when I went around to Stella Maris the first time and saw the, the, the men in tights, I go to her and I said, boy, Auntie Patsy never leave that out in a cars. You want me to go back to Jackson Town, you know? Mm -hmm. If any of my friends them see me in a tights, you know, so I never leave the part there. And she said to me, you can never be a student of dance by thinking that dance hall is the only thing that is going to take you there. Now, when I started to... Auntie Patsy wanted to do a merge between what was modern contemporary and what was dancehall. And she wanted to use me to represent it because she thought as a raw dancehall person, I was able to do it, but it wasn't an original idea. This, this is what was coming out of Professor Nettleford. And then when I finally got into Stella Maris, now I saw again what Monica Lawrence was doing with dancehall and merging it to give it, get, give it this international feel, merging what we did here in dancehall with a little bit of modern and Ray, and realize again that this is something that was coming from Professor Nettleford. So why was there this gap between us that stopped young men like myself coming up from understanding the power of what this man was doing? It was because of classism. It was because one set of people did seem elite. And because of that now, the lack of education for the youth in the inner city that understood only that homosexuality is wrong. That's one way them see it. And if homosexuality is wrong, and it means that if you wind your waistline, you will be representing a woman, then we're not supposed to do none at all. There is no way that I should be representing myself like that. So not just saying that we need conversation, we absolutely have to set platforms mm -hmm. and insist that us as educators reach out there to the grassroots people and put them into the space to have that conversation. And I know I am one of that medium because I work on both sides of the fence and understand it. We need to bring them together to have this conversation. I can freely wind my waistline out, 
as a dance hall youth and as a ghetto youth who are still living in the inner city. I can freely do it because I know what to explain and how to explain it. Let me tell you what I, how I talk to these dance hall youth now. When I started learning about um, modern contemporary and, 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 and ballet, I understood because it was explained to me that it deals with lines and angles. So putting yourself in the close fitting tights, get a you get a chance to see what is happening with the body in terms of the contractions and the what's up. So we know that this is what, how the body moves, we have to see it in, in tights and ray. Mm -hmm. Now these dance hall dancers are wearing tight jeans and me ask them the question, what is your explanation for wearing a tight jeans? Mm -hmm. And why would you wear a tights? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the jeans look like a tights. Mm -hmm. So this is this is my argument to give you. My stockings, okay? <laughs> oh, okay. So no, so so you're saying it's it's based on fashion, but how do I get to see the body? Mm -hmm. How do I get to see the body to correct the body oh, if if the body ever move logic. if the pelvis in action? Logic. So so this is where we want to go with it, but we need to call them into the space, and I have to. Like me for pop my color, I'm for pop a Nila Ibang scholar because we did a lot of this in for dancing dynamite. You get what I say? So we were able to bring them into the Edna Manley space. So a little inner city youth could have know say, all right, this is first position. This is how you pull up. This is how you get the body to look tall. This is what a contraction is. This is so what we need to do is pass it on and make sure that we are reaching, not just think that we're reaching them, but make sure we're reaching them. Yeah. Man, I want to add to that. That's all with us, you know? And I know yes, I have to behave myself, it's Sunday, but you don't, you don't have to just bust a blank for everything where the two of just say, <laughs> and if you don't understand what I'm saying, it's not for you, don't worry about it, but bust a blank. But what you're actually saying, and I'm going to toss this to Neela, is it's conversation, but it's access. For yep. people, marginalized yeah, yeah, people, people yes. of different classes, people, mm -hmm. because the homophobia is not just among the poor, marginalized ghetto people. The homophobia is among the elite. Everywhere. The homophobia and, yeah. and the hating of Africanisms is among the middle class, the petty bourgeois. It's among the bourgeois. It's amongst the Buddha people. It is a consciousness. We are programmed against ourselves. Yes, the yes. Racism, the classism, mm -hmm. the homophobia, the mm -hmm. sexism, the genderization is a mm -hmm. consciousness mm -hmm. of the collective that is programmed against the people. Ourselves, yeah. It's one of the things that is oppressing <clears throat> us. Mm -hmm. and so what you're speaking to Orville and Marlon, mm -hmm. and I'm going to toss this to Neela because I know Neela, Neela is about to beat us real bad with it now. <laughs> now come. Is that... No, I don't conversation we need access and we need yeah. to move the barriers yes right that allow us to face each other to see each other and to understand the fullness of our humanity and understand mm -hmm. that bad mind on all levels suppresses everything about ourselves everything. So you can't say, mm -hmm. jesus christ but you're gonna burn a body man it just don't work talk yeah. to us Taylor. Listen, let me tell you, and it is, it, is, it is so intertwined. It is so, so deeply intertwined. But when you have a nut, what you do? You unpick it one part at a time and you figure out what is going on. In conversation here, we have, my brothers have spoken about things that are part of the unpicking of the nut, right? And that nut is at the center of us not really knowing all of ourselves. Because if you're programmed to hate yourself, that means you hate other parts, yeah, that you think are not you, but we're all the same right? Um, there is, there's a way in which it is, it is tied to these larger ideas, these larger systems, these larger social systems, these larger conversations about gender. Where are those happening? Interesting, in the dance hall is where a lot of conversation is happening around gender. So maybe that is where we have to really have the access, the openness, so that that can feed into the larger populace. The, the church also has a lot of conversation about gender, albeit in a, in a quieter sort of of voice are different under with a different rhythm under it, but it's still there. How can those conversations happen? Because when people are ready, they draw for the Bible, but they can't tell you every single thing they can that they're going by in terms of the Bible. So these conversations are important because we have inherited particularly a lot of um, uh, 
gen, as you said, genderizations, genderisms that are binary in a certain kind of way when human experience is not really binary. And the categorization is not binary. It's, it's not, yes, it's not binary. Trauma so, is not binary. No, not at all. And so, and so, I mean, for example, with masculinities, what has happened is that the masculinities are seen as opposite to femininities. When the truth is within masculinity, if it is really balanced, is a tops of femininity. There has to be because there's humanity. A, a crying must happen. Feelings must happen. Those things that people consider to be feminine but are just traits must happen. Your pelvis supposed to can go 360 degrees though because you are built that way. And it might be good for your partner also if you can do that. Hey, that's something I'm just, you know, throwing out there. So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so, which is something interesting that the Eastern Caribbean men have always wondered why Jamaican men don't just loosen up. Because Eastern Caribbean men don't have no issues necessarily about them gender and masculinity and stuff. Because well, when it went and and they, when it could they drop, they it could drop. It could drop. <laughs> you understand? So, 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 so even within the region, there are all these different kind of ideas. But Orville spoke about the book breaking and Jamaica's centrality in that. So we kind of understand the resistance. But I will tell you even that when some of these, the dancers are youth, them talented enough and come to school and dance, when we work with anat anatomy, we have to do some extra work with them in terms of unlocking them pelvis, you know, is not a joke because the pelvis is so tightly held that the, the mm -hmm. other things that they want to be able to excel at, the length that they want in the back of their hamstrings to get an extension, to kick up the leg, to do, do the full expression of themselves as dancers, it can't happen because the mind lock up. and the pelvis lock up. And so, so there's, as Marlon said, there's this constant dialogue that we have, we work with that at the School of Dance a lot, right? Um, but in what is that happening in other dance spaces? Is that happening in, in dance hall spaces besides Orville's space that he has a sphere of influence over? Is there a national conversation about genders and, and, and gender dynamics and the understanding of sexual orientation versus sexualities? Is that really happening? And that, that may be some pressure that we have to put on our minister, ministry of, of gender affairs now. Because we're at a time where you're finding that those, those sorts of consciousnesses are moving us away from the possibility to evolve and to really get back to the center of ourselves and to live authentically and, 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 and centrally. You have to be able to unpick and say, okay, so I inherited that from there. I inherited that from there. Do I want to keep that as a legacy? Is that painful for us? Is that helpful? We have a choice. We have a choice. And dance all gives it a, that's per, it's a perfect capsule to make a determination for ourselves. This is what we are presented with. This is a crucible we have now. Is everything to be kept well? Because, you know, interestingly, I think it was Sudan most recently um, banned female genital mutilation and child marriage. Like, really, like, like last week or something, it was announced. That's an ingrained mm -hmm. part of their cultural and religious experience. It has taken years of dialogue, political work, activism for that to be unpicked for it to actually go to a parliament and they say, okay, we are doing it. They have to choose. It's a cultural retention. It's something that was, was handed down, but it's not for the good of everyone. There are people who are marginalized and hurt because of it, and so they made a decision. We can make the same decision regarding some of our cultural things that are not serving us into the future. Dance hall has the potential. It is a place of, a, it's a center of light for us. It's a light that shines around the world. We never intended for it to do so, but it did, it, it did so. And so we have to allow it to shine in our own selves again and really see for what it is. Put it on a particular track that is empowering for everyone, that is, that is um, all-encompassing, that is honorable, authentic, full of integrity, joyous, joyful, rich, raucous, car raucous, not bad. Ratchet. You understand? Yes, oh. yes ratchet. No. Yes. Honest. <laughs> Yeah. All of those kinds of things, mm -hmm. but let us let us let us not let us make some choices now. Let us make some cho and choices that are not capital driven either, because sometimes, best believe, I you talk about hip hop culture too. The man behind the machine, in the Wizard of Oz machine, you think you are running the show, but there are puppets because those people behind are making you churn out what they want you to churn out because they know it's low vib vibration stuff. Dance our vibration too high to be low. It's too high to be low, and we have to take it back. And it's That's a serious thing. Narrative. Yeah, man, change the narrative. We can do it. We can do it. The Africans, they, it believes, it's believed that the African proverbs says, you know, the, the lion will always lose the fight when the hunter tells of the game. 
right? Exactly, so exactly. Good point about yeah. how capitalism yeah, yeah. forms what we see and what, how we Very understand so. ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but Sablan, for that too, wow, <laughs> I, told the, I told the speakers, I said, listen, guys, <laughs> we were going to do 60 minutes and then 30 minutes of Q&A, but be, I warn you, the conversation is going to get sweet. And you mm. may not realize that we're going to be over time. Mm -hmm. We are over time, but my goodness, it's a good overtime. It's the kind of overtime that puts you in the mind of those Chicago Bulls games back in 1994. <laughs> it's the kind of overtime you want to see. So uh, we're going to close yeah. out. But you know, sir, my I'm time limited now, though. So I want to mm. share. I want to just hear one, one quick comment that my brother Marlon wants to say. And then I'm going to share a couple because the speakers can't see the Q&A. I want to mm. just give, um, just share a couple of the comments from our live chat. But Marlon, give us a quick. Um, you wanted to share some comments on what was what was expressed, and then I just want to quickly acknowledge some of what's going on in the chat, and then we're going to wrap up. We're going into bulls overtime today. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for that. I mean, I thank Orville and Anita for expressing some points that I agree with, and I think that it is very important that we. I mean, we're all working where we do have a sphere of influence, basically. And it is very small when you think about the impact of the entire island. And for the change that we're, we need in the Jamaican society now, there has to be a louder voice. And this is where it comes at a policy level. The education system has to be reformed yeah. so that mm -hmm. the performing arts can take its rightful role on the mm -hmm. curriculum and not on the fringes where it's seen as a hobby or an extracurricular activity, activity, right? Yes, and then school curriculum, which is mainly focused on, it's very product driven. You either can do it or you can't. Mm -hmm. Very assessment mm -hmm. driven. They pass, they have to go. Transactional, yeah. yeah. You get your two, and then to de-stress, you can have a dance club afterwards. Mm -hmm. So really, dance, drama, music, the, the theater arts generally does not become a central focus of the curriculum where you help to build the character of the individual in a well-rounded way from early on, mm -hmm. not from grade um, 11, um, nine or grade 10 or 11, when you would have needed a formative year to help to shape the identity of the individual. So it, be, it, it has to happen at the policy level. The government has yeah. been fundamental and integral to shaping the Jamaican society and the way we behave and interact with each other, the way mm -hmm. we see each other, and the way we come together to achieve a, a perspective or a goal or an idea, it has to be the education system. And I believe mm -hmm. that if the education system delivers on the curriculum the way it should, by putting the performing arts in, it, in its rightful place, then dance will yeah. be stigmatized. Build a dance studio in the schools across the country. Yes. Bring in the dance, yes. the artists, the music teachers. Let them, let them help with teaching maths and English and social and bio and all those kinds of things. Where is a cross-disciplinary approach to learning that is needed so that dance is not seen as something other on a stage inaccessible in Leeds, but something that is fundamental to your experience of the curriculum in totality. And I think that will help to destigmatize the dance. It will bring into the conversation ideas about sexuality, which are completely different from the perceptions that are not true, and it will bring to the, to, 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 the, to the conversation gender identity so that we understand each other. Yeah. I see you and you see me in, and recognize that we need each other in terms of having an impact on this world in the way we should. Ashe, Ashe, oh. Words sound power, so the tingle. In the comments, we have um, Cheryl Alid. We're going to shout out Cheryl Alid every week. She's in the <laughs> audience, so we have to big her up. We have to ask her a question. All right, so we said, Cheryl wants to know if you all collaborate. Now, I know Orville and Neela, you all collaborate. Will there be any, any invitations of an Orville Hall choreography at NDTC? Can we get some Orville expressions at NDTC? Marlon, what's going on? Let me tell you. Let me tell you, I did a dancehall piece like from yesterday. Chris Walker, who is one of our choreographers, did a dancehall piece called Senoff. And Senoff was looking at the contemporary way of a contemporary wake in Jamaica where 
we no longer have the traditional send off with the um the kumina and the and the garabenta what we have is a dance hall speaker boxes coming in and that is how the person sent out i remember when i was growing up the number one sound system i don't know if mila and uh, and Orville Rumor Boys, Bass Odyssey, and Stone Love. Stone Love, of course. Yeah. Now, there are so many others. The, the, I, mean, I think the representation of sound system is not as it was when I was growing up, where those traveling sound, when, when the sound system come out of your ear and, and the box them unpack and stuck up on top of each other, you know, some big things are going on. <laughs> Hence right. why we use this for the, that's the reason why we use, that's a picture of a Stone Love sound system on the flyer. Oh, no yeah, no speakers set up in the yard. It's all right. over. <laughs> so I know. I it's know, an I, event. Yes. Neil and I, are, Neil and I know, Neil and I, as, as she's director of studies at the School of Dance, we're also working on a dance hall program coming up. So mm -hmm. that's going to be in our curriculum at the Edna Manley College coming up soon. More on that later. That's but cool. in terms of moving from the dance hall piece that Chris Walker had done in 2005, I think it was 2006, thereabouts, and Professor had done a dance hall. Do you remember this song? Look into my eye. Tell me what is. Tell me what you see. Baby okay. Sham. Professor. Professor. Mm -hmm. Love the dancehall rhythm so much. And dancehall rhythm of that particular time when he did that work. It was called um, Apocalypse in 2009. That was a year before he died. That's Professor. So Professor Nettleford choreographed a piece to Look Into My Eyes by Bounty Killer. Oh, but he did more than that. Mm -hmm. Wow. What Professor used to say, Professor, you, he said in one of his writings that if an artist is going to put, like for instance, a painter is going to give you a likeness of your image on canvas, then he may as well take a photograph. Mm -hmm. For him, it was about listening and distilling and abstracting and manipulating what's around him to create something that is fresh and visually interesting. So Professor for months with the little this that we know was out there listening to dance hall. Now Professor would normally immerse himself in the music at home and also in his car. So when he's driving around to the studio to have his classes, you'd hear the music before he's approaching. So can you just my for years we've been hearing the music by all the different arts, African artists and reggae. One, one, when he started working on his dance hall piece, that was a song that greeted us in the parking lot when he was driving in for class. We're like, oh Jesus, what is Professor coming with now? Professor worked with Marju Wiley, used the dance hall rhythms, like about four or five or six tracks from dance hall, gave the musical director at the time, Marju Wiley, to work on the vocal intonations of sounds, tribal ancestral sounds on top of a dance hall rhythm to create the visual, the, the oral nuances of the work that he was trying to express. And guess what he did? He built a dance based on an inner city domestic situation where a rebel, a dance hall youth, had a girlfriend out there who decided that she was gonna leave and go to the Revival Church and join the, the, the church. And he went in there to get her to, to, to come out of the church and go back into the world. And guess what happened to him? He was converted and he became the shepherd and leader of the flock. Mm. I think there's a, there's a larger message that is in that dance hall piece that he choreographed. But yes, Orville, to answer your question about Orville, Orville, we're going to talk. We're going to talk. All right. So there'll be a, what, what's happening here is I'm having a little technical difficulty. My Mac is cutting us off. It's about, I, I'm, I'm not plugged in and my Mac is going to cut out real soon. Mm. So I'm going to wrap. I can let y'all keep talking, but you're going to lose me. And that may mm. not be a bad thing. But let's, <laughs> <laughs> let's wrap, um, you know, if, I'm going to do something. I know, Orville, you want to say something quick. The issue is my, my laptop is going to go out. Um, oh, no, I really have to run now. That's, that's, that's what right. I've been so trying we're gonna, to say. We're going to wrap now. Let me just close out mm -hmm. by saying this has been an incredible... Let's see if I can do this in one second because that's all I have left. It's been an incredible time talking with you all. Bob Marley says in his one drop, now see it, feel it in the drum beat, playing the rhythm, resisting against the system. That is what dance hall is about. It's about resisting any system that suppresses the people. Mm -hmm. Next week, we will be talking December 6th with the playwrights as they answer George Bernard Shaw, David Tullock, Fabian Thomas, and Basil Dawkins. Listen, Jamaican people said, what good? Artists, we actors, we say, see you on the board. Listen, what good on the board? Thank you. Here? All right.